to the point with Congressman Bill Pascrell, focusing on the concerns and issues facing the families of New Jersey's 9th Congressional District. Hello, I'm Congressman Bill Pascrell, and I'd like to welcome you to this latest edition of To the Point. As a nation, we are still coming to grips with the events in Charlottesville, Virginia this summer, as well as President Trump's response. It's been several decades since images of white supremacists gathering publicly have been splashed across the media outlets. Many of my viewers may have learned about the Ku Klux Klan or the Nazi regime in school, so it may be easy to write it off as an unfortunate part of history and nothing more than that. Yet, even in 2017, the United States is faced with the issue of white supremacy. For those who are experts in such fields, like my guest, the rise in radical right-wing ideology comes as no surprise. In 2009, Daryl Johnson authored a report on homegrown extremism as a Department of Homeland Security analyst. Unfortunately, that report was discarded by the Obama administration under pressure from a Republican Congress and a right-wing media. Today, we'll discuss that report, the resistance he faced when he published it, and the current status of those extrapolations. Daryl Johnson, I want to thank you for being here today. I'm proud of you as an American. You are a frontiersman as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Bill. Uh, last year, I organized a, a briefing. You were at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I thought, I thought it was interesting. Uh, we talked about right-wing extremism from a number of people. And uh, you have been at the forefront uh, since 2009. We'll discuss that report in a few moments. But the New York Times wrote this about you. You better listen. The New York Times wrote this about you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, quote, his words drew fierce criticism from Republican lawmakers and conservative news media, labeling the report an unfair assessment of legitimate criticisms of the government. The document was retracted after Janet Napolitano, who was then the Homeland Security Secretary, apologized to veterans and the extremism and radicalization branch was quietly dismantled. What's, is that a fair assessment, or, or what would you add to it? That is a fair assessment, and it's quite surprising that that happened. I mean, I had worked as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. government at that point for 15 years, wow. uh, looking at these, these issues. You here had in the America. credentials. Yeah. You in worked fact, under Republican administration and Democratic administration. Yes, and I was a senior intelligence analyst, a team lead. Right. Uh, so I actually went out and hired people that had similar qualifications as myself to look at these groups. And we were building that expertise in the Department of Homeland Security. We were receiving a lot of positive feedback from state and local law enforcement officials and, and other government officials that we served. So you were working for the government before there was a Homeland Security Committee. Yeah, it started in 1991. 1991. Yep. So that's interesting to note that you, you weren't just a figurehead. You've been there, someone might say, I don't say, but you, some might say you're a career person with the government looking at those folks who want to do us harm. Yes. And uh, what was the first thing, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you talk about that period of time? What's the first thing, Daryl, that struck you about your review, your investigations up to that moment? I was just doing my job, uh, what I was trained to do, and so uh, this whole report that I wrote in 2009 actually began with a phone call from the Capitol Police in 2007. Uh, they wanted us to monitor the internet, look at extremist websites that were publicly available to see if there was any threats to Barack Obama once he announced his uh, intentions to run for president. Right, right. Did you do any of that work? We had analysts under my uh, team right. that looked at those websites, and we monitored that for a few months, and uh, nothing originally happened. But right. once he won that Democratic nomination, that's when we started seeing the uptick in threats. And it opened up. It just yep. opened up. 
And, and people became brazen about the fact that, well, God, we may have a black president. Yes. And that's, what kind of things did you look at at that time? Uh, we were looking at Internet chatter. Uh, we were looking at, you know, how many groups we had out there, the level of criminal activity and violence yeah. that were perpetrated. And we were actually in kind of a dormant period for far right extremism back in the mid 2000s. Uh, we, you know, had an uptick in eco terrorism and things like that. Uh, but really, it was with Obama's announcement that he was running for president that led to a huge recruitment boom. Darrell, let me ask you a question. Go back to the end of the 90s during those latter period when Bill Clinton was the president. Mm -hmm. We had a horrific situation in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. Timothy McVeigh. Uh, he certainly was not recruited by uh, Al Qaeda or anybody. He was a homegrown guy. Mm -hmm. And he destroyed and killed many people in the whole Oklahoma City bombing. He was an admitted supremacist. He was an admitted person that went out to kill people and blew up some building, the building besides. And of course, uh, I remember the president going to Oklahoma City, trying to bring calm and security and comfort would you say that was the most significant uh, ex expression of extremism since the time you started to work for the government? Yeah, from the domestic terrorism. I mean, there were standpoint. others, but was that the most extreme? Yes, and resulted in the most deaths. It's what we call a mass casualty producing event. And so what we had in the aftermath of Oklahoma City is, you know, media scrutiny of these groups. We had a public backlash against these groups. So the things quieted. Yeah, law enforcement cracked yeah. down on these groups. Yeah. And so leading up to the millennium, Y2K, it was kind of like once that happened, these groups kind of, you know, got bored with the revolution that never came. They kept predicting that the end of the world right, was right. going to happen or the right. economy was going to collapse or what have you. And combination of states passing paramilitary uh, laws, banning paramilitary training, uh, states banning militia groups from forming and conducting firearms uh, training. Right. Uh, we had those laws passed. People got bored with the revolution. The law enforcement cracked down. And so all of that led kind of to a lull in right-wing extremism. And all of this resurfaced in 2007, 2008. Okay, so there's a time period there. There's a lull, and then we're back into the game as we're fighting Al-Qaeda, as we are in Iraq, Iraq, and we are in Afghanistan. These are the things that are happening. Now, that uh, is the report that you presented in 2009. Remember in the Homeland Security Committee, uh, Secretary Napolitano sitting in front of us and telling us that this wasn't going to go any further, and I blew my stack. Mm. This is not about me, though. This is about you. I blew my stack for a very specific reason, that they were deep-sixing it, my words, for the simple reason that they're getting a lot of flack from the right wing of the Republican Party, from Congress members. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what they did. In fact, they ended the uh, radicalization branch, the extremism and a radicalization at that point. Yep. So they were, they, they were finished, done, completely done. And what did you do? What was your response to this whole thing? Did you say, these guys are making a big mistake? What, what, what in your report, and I, I read it several times, to you is the most important thing that we should have taken away from that report? So the most important thing you should have taken from this report is that the threat, threat landscape was changing. Okay? As you imagine, after 9-11, the, the U.S. government's counterterrorism efforts, and rightfully so, was focused on overseas threats, al-Qaeda, right. uh, trying to prevent the next 9-11. Right. And that was all well and good. However, a new threat was emerging, and we needed to let federal, state, and local law enforcement know that, hey, you're going to have to devote some resources to this as well. And so, here. Homegrown yeah. here. Yes. People who believe that the government is either out to get them, uh, the government doesn't want them to be able to say what they want to say, almost like an anti-government movement at that particular time. Yeah, you can split the movement into two large spheres. You have the hate-motivated groups like the white supremacists, right. KKK, neo-Nazis, skinheads, 
Aryan prison gangs, Christian identity, which is a racist religious uh, right. philosophy. And then you've got the anti-government groups like the sovereign citizens, the militia extremists, and other anti-government people. Now, when I read uh, your report, and then I look at what happened in May of this year, we're talking about Charlottesville. This happened, this report came out, the Joint Intelligence Bulletin, on the 10th of May, 2017. Tell me your take on this. What does it say? Well, I appreciate And this your, is the report that I gave you to look at and you have read it. Right. I appreciate your staff sharing that with me. Uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely a, a good attempt to, you know, let the nation know and to let policymakers know that, hey, the FBI and DHS are aware of this white uh, nationalist uh, right. extremist threat. Uh, after looking at it, the one thing that kind of stood out to me is I felt that the trade craft could have been a little bit better. Uh, they mentioned that there were six uh, violent attacks by white supremacists in 2016. Mm. Uh, they listed four, uh, you know, in the report, and right. then on a graph, they actually show that there was only one attack in 2016. So, in one effort, you're saying there's six, and then yeah. you describe four of them, but only show one on your chart. Well, I can me, think let of me others. Tell you my take on that, and sure. you tell me if I'm off base. I got a, I got a feeling when I read that, and I've read it several times. And I didn't read it until after, after Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. I didn't read it until after Charlottesville, okay? So I read it, it's a shout out, but reserved, mm -hmm. conditional. And the numbers are low. And the numbers are very low. So why be alerted, America? Is this the way this report should have been presented to the American people? No, because number one, it doesn't accurately accurately capture all of the lethal violence that has happened in, within the white supremacy right. movement against minorities and other communities. Uh, but if you actually look at the graph, there's years where they show no attacks. 2010, 2011, they say there were no white supremacist violent attacks. That's not true. Yeah. And if you look at from 2013 to 2016 on their graph, it shows that it's decreasing when in reality it's increasing. And like I said, I, I know of at least you know, three or four more incidents just off the top of my head that not not even included in this report. So it's one thing for President, for uh, candidate Obama, that's one thing, gets people upset and in right-wing circles. Another thing, now he's the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. Do you know for a fact if there were threats on the President's life? During yeah. This period? In fact, we discovered numerous threats that we refer to the U.S. Secret Service during this time. Uh, you know, yeah. it started proliferating so much that the Secret Service had to stand up its own unit just to keep up with all these new threats that were coming in. Uh, I've seen in some of the news reporting that, you know, there were more threats against President Obama than like the previous four presidents combined. Wow. So they were alerted uh, because of these threats that were direct. They protect the president. That's their job. They do a sensational job as far as I'm concerned. And at the same time, these groups are not going to give up. And they didn't disappear this time. Right. So you figure President Obama is no longer the president of the United States. They're going to go home. They're emboldened. Well. They're enabled. Am I too strong? No, you're not. In fact, what's, ah, go what's happening right now goes against all of the trends that I've seen in the 25 years now that I've been looking at this issue. Uh, normally right-wing extremists, we're talking white supremacists, militias, sovereign citizens, they increase and become more active under democratic administrations because they're fearful that their guns are going to be taken away or that there'll be some sort of gun laws passed. Or, you know, in the case of Barack Obama, you, they had their worst nightmare huh. confirmed in the fact that we had an African-American in the, in the White House. Typically during Republican administrations, we see a dial back. But that has not been the case in 2017. In fact, what we've seen is continued heightened activity, continued violence, uh, continued recruiting going on. And it has a lot to do with the 2016 election, uh, with the rhetoric that was right. used during the campaign. Uh, some of the things that candidate Trump uh, talked about from his platform, such as building a border wall. Uh, mass right down deportations, their alley. Right down their alley. mass deportations of uh, illegal immigrants, right. 
uh, not allowing certain people to enter the country with travel bans. Yeah. These were things I read about on white nationalist websites 10 years ago. But if and the now they're being spoken from a political platform. If and the that's government dangerous. is complicit and doesn't or doesn't do anything because certain members of Congress feel that it's gone too far, I'm not, I am not in any way implying that members of Congress, certain members of Congress, want this violence to go on. Mm -hmm. But they certainly have turned a deaf ear to what the heck is happening. I mean, you and I are not making up these situations where there has been violence. You didn't create Timothy McVeigh, and I hope I didn't create Timothy McVeigh. And, and the other Timothy McVeighs that before that and after that have been found to try to destroy this government or many parts of this government. Now, while the, gut, while the people are supreme, the government is needed to keep law and order here in this country. And I'm very sus suspect of people who keep on tearing down the government, say it has no place in our society, anti-government. Whatever you say about the government, well, we don't need a government, or we minimize the effect, except when Hurricane Harvey comes calling. Then all of a sudden, we need the government. In fact, we need the government unlike we, we, we had when we had our storm in New Jersey of Sandy, when they turned their backs on us, the very people who are part of this right-wing junk that's out there, which I call them the enablers. I think that they enable these people to feel stronger, tougher, and going to do whatever ever the heck they want. Yeah, the so, one thing that needs to be realized ahead. by politicians is you know, you need to understand the effect and the impact your words have on the mentally ill and people that are embracing fringe uh, ideologies and extremists. Speak, uh, my friend. Yeah, so you need to be aware of that. They're, you're playing with fire. When you say these things from the campaign trail to try to, you know, get a base of support so you can get the votes to win the election, yeah. you're playing with fire. It's very dangerous. You play with anger. You play with fear. Paranoia. You play with the anger of somebody coming in that doesn't look like you taking a job. Hmm. And that's been disproven so many, many times. You play with your heartfelt resentment of anybody getting ahead of you, particularly if they don't look like you or don't cook their foods like you. You play on that. You, light, you keep on lighting matches. They're bound to go off. I personally think that if we would have done what you had recommended and suggested back in 2009, well, before that, but it was actually we did away with it in 2009 and the organization that put it together, we could have prevented a lot of things from happening. Now, how do you prevent things from happening? You don't prevent things from happening by ignoring them. That's true. And, you know, during my congressional testimony in 2012, after the Sikh temple shooting, I recommended another uh, number of things. That was in California? Uh, that was up in Wisconsin, Wisconsin, at Oak Creek, Wisconsin. Uh, there were six people killed at a Sikh temple. Yeah, what, what was the source of that? Who, who were the murderers? A white supremacist mistook the Sikh temple as a mosque and went in there and killed people because he thought they were Muslims, and they yeah. weren't. They were Hindus. Uh, but anyway, I well, mentioned... Well, no Muslim shall appear and approach the country, the borders... What the heck are we doing? <laughs> yeah. If that isn't if that isn't prejudice outright, you can't, that's not free speech. That's downright violent talk. Yeah, as and far there's as been I'm more concerned. violence against Muslims by you know white supremacists and others who have yet been identified. Uh, there there have been uh, Muslims attacking whites. I mean, there's been has that been exposed enough in your mind? No. Darryl? In fact, uh, when we went through a series of mosque arsons in 2014. There was not a peep from the FBI or Homeland Security about this increase in mosques being burned across the country. Uh, the fact that we've got armed militia groups conducting protests trying to intimidate right. Muslims. The fact that they perpetrate these lies about how Sharia laws being, you know, implemented throughout the country or trying to be, you know, right. uh, you know, these things are just ludicrous. But yet the very victims of these crimes are Muslims and we think that they're the threat. I mean, that hits you right here. That we could have prevented this? Are you saying, Congressman, you could have prevented Charlottesville? Well, the night before, Friday night, when they assembled on the campus of the University of Virginia, not only did they have the torches, but many of them had weapons. 
Now, how can the president equalize this stuff? Say, hey, they're nice guys on both sides. <laughs> I mean, that floored me when he did that. Yeah, and that, was, what was your response? Uh, I couldn't believe some of the things he said to sit there and accuse, you know, both the left and the right as being equally responsible, I think, is reckless and an outright lie. Uh, in the past, we have seen a lot of agitators at the, you know, KKK rallies and stuff from the far left. Definitely. Uh, they engage in property destruction. Uh, they have disrespect to law enforcement. But to sit there and say that they rank up there with the white supremacist threat uh, is just ludicrous. I mean, white supremacists are the ones that kill people. They're the most lethal threat that we have uh, here in the country. But we do have some extreme left-wing groups. Yes. And they have used violence yes. at times. And, and not only to protect themselves, they've done it to make, to incite almost, to mm -hmm. incite. But what I have recognized over the past five or six years is the amount of right-wing groups that have brought hell to bear on police officers. Very seldom do we talk about that either. Yep. Very seldom do we talk about that. So there are folks out there, there are folks out there who wish harm not only to the government, the representatives of the government itself, police officers. Most of the time they're outgunned in these kinds of situations. Yep. You know, so everybody says, let everybody carry, and it depends on which state you live in. And by the way, you brought this out and you reported 2009. So I did. The amount of artillery that was out there yep. by many of these groups. One important statistic that I brought up in my congressional testimony was I looked at all 230-something terrorism cases against Muslims here in the United States up until from 9-11, you know, 2001, all the way up to 2012 when I gave right. my testimony. Right. Okay, and I looked at all the court documents, and I compiled all the weaponry that these 230-some-odd Muslim terrorist suspects had amassed. Yes. And would you know that one militia member who was actually acquitted up in Michigan had more firepower in his basement than all 230-something um, uh, Muslim terrorists combined? <laughs> and it wasn't even one. close. It wasn't one. even a close. How, did you, was that put out in a report? I put it in my congressional testimony, and Dick Durbin actually was stunned with that very fact. Did you get me that report? Could sure. You get me that? I didn't see that report. I, that slipped by me. I must yeah. apologize. Most of the terrorism charges against Muslim Americans are for providing material support to terrorists, whether it's money, right. food, clothing. And, that, uh, and that's horrible enough. But right. It's, but we're talking, we're talking, we're talking about, about people violence. that have bombs and yeah. machine guns and grenades and things like that, and yet nobody talks about that. Well, let me ask you this. Um, do you think we do enough in terms of, you know, can we do enough in combating uh, left Islamic terrorism, the extreme Islam, rather than vilify the entire religion, which right, many sure. right wingers do? Uh, do you think we do enough in that regard? And we could and could we do a better job in the United States about that well, without inciting the entire Muslim community. Sure. I mean, we are doing enough. Uh, there's, you know, dozens of federal agencies that look at, you know, international terrorism. Uh, you have a whole intelligence community and a right. whole Department of Defense that's engaged on counterterrorism against ISIS and al-Qaeda. But when it comes to domestic terrorists that, you know, American citizens, you're talking one agency. And that's the FBI. They're a law enforcement agency. Why haven't we cited your report or the report which came out just a, several months ago in May uh, about right wing white supremacy? Why haven't that? Why hasn't it been cited more by the media or, or whatever parts of the media as to alarm us to communicate to us? that we better know and better watch what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. People well, are going to get hurt. It's a combination of a bunch of different issues. Uh, number one, you know, we become conditioned as a society because of 9-11, because of these horrific attacks over in Europe, that in order for it to be terrorism, you have to have, you know, hundreds of people killed. Uh, when we're talking about white supremacists, they kill, you know, one person here, five people there. 
And so a lot of times people just dismiss these things as hate crimes right. or just, you know, mass shootings or just a isolated, you know, violence that's occurred. Right. Uh, so we, as a society, have kind of preconditioned ourselves as to what terrorism is. But we also have an administration that does not even acknowledge that there is white terrorism. Okay, when they scale back the Countering Violent Extremism program and take grant funding away from the very few organizations that were even focused on trying to counter the white nationalist message keep on bringing that up. and say that the only violent extremism is the Muslim variety, you're doing a huge disservice to the country and right. you're doing a huge disservice to the community because there are multiple types of threats, right. not just Muslims. Right. And of course, we don't have more, much more time. But also, Darrell, I want to talk, uh, we don't have time to talk about it, we should be thinking about what causes this? What, what is at the foundation, uh, whether left or right, uh, of you becoming violent against people within your own community and society because of a political point? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big question we need to talk about. Yep. And, you know, we could talk about social conditions, we could talk about that to a blue in the face. But the fact of the matter is, well, these are things we need to be alerted to, the community needs to be related to. I want to thank you personally. I want to say thank you for your service. And what are you doing right now, by the way? I'm doing some consulting work on the side for state and local law enforcement. Great. Well, I'm proud of you. And I want you to know thank you for your service. You're I'm welcome. sure our listeners and our watchers here, our viewers, feel the same as I do. You stood up. You were not silent. And you did it professionally, and you did it because you believed in it. Thanks for being part of our show. You're welcome. That's what I was paid for. You're going to come back again. All right. So you've heard our thoughts. Now I would like to hear what you think about today's show, folks. If you have any comments, concerns, or questions, stay tuned. Our address, the phone number, uh, the website address will appear in a moment. Uh, thanks again for tuning in to see you and we'll see you the next time on To The Point. Listen. All it took was someone who would insist that I just try. Suddenly, everything was turned around because they judge you. You tell them, I don't need this. No one is going to understand. Unless they've been through it, how can they? Then one day you realize, you feel so hopeless. I need help. I need help. You feel so hopeless. Then one day you realize... Unless they've been through it, how can they understand? I don't need this. No one's going to judge you. Suddenly everything was turned around because they insist that I just try. All it took was someone who would just... Listen.